before we start, this is like kind of a second part or more practical and uh, to my first talk. And my first talk, for those people who were not here, I was introducing the concept of an oblivious pseudo-random function, which is a very sexy cryptographic primitive. And I was showing uh, where they come from, what you can do with them, what kind of properties they have. Uh, some of them are more flexible, some are less flexible, some have super uh, strong security guarantees, some can do other things, and uh, they're super versatile, and, um, and uh, they, should, they, they are in a lot of places already today, and I, I expect them to be even more often and widely deployed in the future. And so that was like a theoretic um, foundation. And I'm going to refer back to some of the things I said in the previous um, talk. And I'm sorry if um, I try not to do that, basically. Um, but um, yeah, um, there is some continuity. Um, Are we ready? Cool. cool. Okay. So welcome to this last talk of today. I'm going to talk about uh, my my project Klutschnik. It has a much more complicated uh, abbreviation, which I'm going to resolve soon. It's basically a key management thingy. That's it's the keeper of the seven keys. It's just such a brilliant. Uh, illustration to this whole concept, I had to steal this this, uh, this cover. Um, so, uh, But uh, first, before we get into the topic, I'm going to do a short detour. What is hybrid crypto? It's basically what we do when we encrypt things everywhere. It's a hybrid crypto system where we com combine asymmetric with symmetric crypto. Asymmetric crypto has some um, public key cryptography, has some properties that are super sexy, but it's not very efficient to calculate it over large pieces of data, so we actually use symmetric crypto like IES block ciphers or stream ciphers to encrypt large pieces of data, and then only the encryption key is being encrypted with the public key uh, that uh, comes from the asymmetric crypto system. So this, uh, this is an example of how PGP does it. This is like, uh, I don't know how well visible this is, but up here you see I'm just encrypting the, uh, the text ISDF, for a recipient that has a key that is, the key ID is AAA, and then the output is immediately dumped in how this is actually looking uh, in binary, uh, the PGP key. And it has two parts. The first part is an encrypted session key, which is encrypted with your PGP key that is uh, referred to with the key ID AAA, and this encrypts an IS key. And this IES key is encrypting the data that is, that is in the second packet. This is one PGP key encrypting to one person, um, and uh, this is the public, using the public key of this one person and encrypting the IES key for um, the message that is ISDF, really. So this is, this is how PGP does implement a hybrid crypto system. And this is something that comes from the 90s and it exists until today. And then we have this more modern implementation of uh, a file encryption. This is AGA or age, depending on, I never bothered to check how you pronounce it. This is the definition or the specification of AGA, how they encrypt. Basically, they do the same. You have a, what kind of key is being used. It's, a, it's an asymmetric crypto key. Then this is, um, this is actually the encrypted key. Uh, and then this is, I think, uh, the Mac over this section. So, and then the message is being encrypted. So even modern kind of tools use the same concept of a hybrid crypto system. This is coming from, I don't know, a few years ago. So it is like 2010-ish when Agar was designed and uh, is kind of deployed. So nothing really changed except for maybe how things happen and how they calculate max and, and some things. So this is, this is pretty boring and old school stuff. And then we have this thing that we call a key management service. And uh, now we're getting into what Kluchnik is. And in, in a key management service, you have three parties. You have a client who is trying to do things. 
and you have a storage which might be or is probably remote and it's very good in storing large uh, amounts of data. That is what is good at. And we have a key management service which is very good at protecting keys. And so we compartmentalize, the, we separate the roles of storing data and handling the encryption of that data. And we have a, a third party that is the client that is actually orchestrating anything, all the operations that you want to do, encryption or decryption or, or other things in your crypto system. This is something that you want to do maybe in the cloud or in a more automatic environment or um, um, there's many ways uh, where this becomes useful. Today it's mostly used, this setup is used in the cloud. And uh, traditional KMS encryption is a, is a very simple thing actually. It's exactly what I have been showing with PGP and Agra. The KMS has a asymmetric public key, cryptographic key, which we call the key encryption key. It encrypts keys, nothing else. And we abbreviate it as CAC. And the client, when it encrypts some file, it chooses a data encryption key, which is basically the IIS key and PGP or something. Right? And we call that the data, data encryption key. And it just uses the data encryption key to encrypt the data. And then you have ciphertext. And then the client sends this data encryption key to the KMS, which then wraps or encrypts the data encryption key with the, um, with the key encryption key and then sends the encrypted key, uh, key encry uh, data encryption key back to the client, and the client can store the encrypted data encryption key and the encrypted file uh, somewhere on the storage. And that's it. This is basically also what PGP is doing, but in one uh, tool. There's no separation of uh, something that encrypts the key. It's all happening in the same software. But here, you have a client and a KMS that are cooperating, and in the end, encrypted data with the encrypted key that is encrypting the data is stored in the storage. So this is like the separation of these duties that you have in a KMS system. So this is traditional KMS encryption. And this, uh, the decryption is the, the opposite way. This is nothing surprising. You, the client gets the encrypted data with the encrypted key. It takes the encrypted key, sends it to the uh, KMS system. The KMS system checks if you're authorized and then uses the key encryption key to decrypt the data encryption key and sends back the data encryption key to the client who now can decrypt the file and then is happy. That's it. So this is really straightforward. There's nothing exciting about this except for this is like what PGP or Age is doing except it's, uh, there's a separation of someone is handling the key encryption key and not in the same process, even probably not on the same uh, hardware. So this is, there's nothing really exciting about this, but this sucks because the KMS gets to know all the data encryption keys because the client sends the data encryption keys for encryption. So the KMS knows all the keys. Then the data encryption key, also the security depends on being encrypted in transport to the KMS because if there's uh, someone listening on your network, they learn all your data encryption keys. You don't want that, right? So, and then if you use TLS, you have like these middle boxes or TLS termination endpoints, they also learn your key. So there's a lot, even if you don't have a man in the middle, there's a lot of boxes in between your client and the KMS that learn the data encryption keys, and that really sucks. You really don't want that. And also, because the keys are tied to the data encryption, uh, data IDs, the KMS also learns which files you decrypt or encrypt. So the KMS learns almost everything about what you're doing and uh, learns all the keys and everything. And if your key encryption key is lost, uh, replacing it costs a lot of time. This is something you can only delete the key, the old key encryption key, as soon as all your encrypted data is re-encrypted with a new key. Because until then, you still need the old key if something goes wrong and you need to like, still, you have to keep two keys at, at the same time, the old one and the new one, until everything is migrated to the new one. So this, this really sucks. And um, the idea is to replace, uh, to use a, an OPRF. And this is where some of you who were not here are wondering, what is an OPRF? An OPRF is a function um, that calculates a value based on two inputs. The key, in this case, 
key that belongs to the client C, and some input. But uh, only one party of this computation learns the output of this function, and none of the parties learn the input of the other party. So imagine you have Alice and Bob, and they want to compute in very, very simplistic terms just the addition of two values they have, and only Alice will learn the output of this addition. So Alice inputs one, Bob inputs two, and Alice learns three. But neither Bob learns what Alice's input was, nor Bob learns what Alice's input was. So, but of course, Alice can calculate. She inputted one. The output is three. She can calculate it. But in, in, a, in this cryptographic sense, she's not able to actually deduce the value of Bob. But, so my example is really stupid, and it's not very helpful. But an OPRF is really this kind of computation where two parties compute one function, and only one party learns uh, something, the, the result, and nothing else. So, and if you do this, then you can use this key that is stored on the key MS, this is KC, and the data ID as inputs to the OPRF. And the client is the only one who learns the data encryption key. This has so many benefits that, if you remember this slide, replacing the, or using an OPRF actually eliminates almost all problems of why KMS is suck. Because the KMS doesn't learn any data encryption key anymore. The KMS doesn't depend on any security uh, of the transport when you transport the da uh, data encryption key. There is no data encryption key being transported. And because you don't transport anything, you don't, it's already encrypted. You don't need TLS to encrypt anything in between. You don't need an expensive PKI infrastructure. You don't need certs. You know, don't need anything like that. And the input from the client, the data ID, is also not learned by the KMS. So the KMS cannot trace which files are being encrypted or decrypted. So this is, this is all pretty cool. And we're almost back to what we had at the moment when we were using GPG or age. Uh, when all this was in the same place. But um, it gets be better. But there's still one bullet point that is not solved. So how do we solve that? It's super easy. If you have seen my previous uh, presentation, you just use an updatable OPRF. And um, I'm going to show you later, I think. No. Uh, maybe I will. I don't know. So basically, an updatable OPRF is where the server, the KMS in this case, chooses a, a new key and calculates uh, a delta between the old key and the new key. And if you use elliptic curves, then the delta is only 32 bytes. And the uh, KMS can send these 32 bytes uh, directly to the storage without using the client. And the, the, the storage, all it has to do is using those 32 bytes and add them to all um, one value. I'm going to show this later. I think I have a slide for that. So let me skip this, how an updated KMS actually works. But there's one uh, caveat here. Um, if you use a threshold system, you need to have at least two T plus one shareholders. This is a hard limit, and we're going to uh, understand what that means later on when I'm telling you about threshold system. Because, that is the next slide, if you use this whole thing in the threshold setup, you have a threshold updatable oblivious KMS and you don't have a single point of failure. The KMS itself, where your keys were stored, was something that can be DOS, that's something that can be attacked by a uh, nation state adversary or someone with a, with a stick uh, hitting you in the head, uh, and then they have your key. And that's something you don't want. But if you just explode this key into many shares that are shared across multiple uh, devices and multiple servers, in possibly multiple jurisdictions, then it gets much more difficult to actually get access to the key. And the nice thing is that um, I'm going to show you later, actually this key is never reconstructed. This is just a, an imaginary concept that there is a key. The key never manifests itself in any, in any computer, in any RAM. It's just all the shares are contributing to, the to, to calculating an OPRF without actually the key actually ever manifesting itself. It's super cool. So this whole thing comes from this uh, awesome paper, Updatable Oblivious Key Management for Storage Systems. 
This is from these three guys, and uh, Stanislav Jareski and Hugo Kravchik are two staples of cryptographic protocols. That we have to thank especially Hugo uh, a bunch of primitives that we are using on an everyday basis, like HMAX, uh, OPRS, OPAC, um, uh, uh, K KDF, HKDF as a uh, hash based uh, key derivation function. These are all primitives that we are using on a daily basis. Basically, when you use the internet, all these things, these come from this guy. He has, he, uh, in 2017, he got his uh, Lifetime Achievement Award from Real World Crypto. Um, he's like, he's one of the, the secret um, heroes of, of cryptography that you probably never heard of, and you should have. So remember, also Stanislav, these two guys are working together very often, and whatever they do is just awesome. So if you just look at papers coming out and see these two names, I'm usually getting very excited. Um, and this was when I saw this paper, and then I just sat down and implemented it, and this is um, the result also. So. <clears throat> Over traditional KMS, it hides the keys and the object identifiers. This we already knew. Um, <clears throat> it offers uh, unconditional security for key, tra tra key transport. This means um, unconditional security is something that we have as a concept. This is the same as uh, one-time pass, uh, one-time pad. You cannot crack a one-time pad. It's uh, impossible to do, and that's why we call it unconditional, because it means the attacker has absolutely no constraints. It can have unlimited computing power, it can have like clusters of quantum computers, and yet it will not be able to, to crack this. Unfortunately, this is actually only uh, true for the data, uh, but not quite for the key, but uh, in the um, threshold setting it is also to, it provides key verifiability. That means if you have a KMS, you have to, and you try to encrypt something, uh, you want to know or uh, that the, the key that is being the data encryption key that is provided by the KMS is actually something that you are able later on to decrypt also. So you don't want the KMS to corrupt your data with a key that you can never decrypt. And so with, uh, you can actually verify that this key is a valid key that you generated that will be able to uh, decrypt stuff later on. Uh, the, the storage that is needed for the key itself is extremely small. It's only 32 bytes. There's nothing else you need. So it's really, really efficient storage-wise. And uh, with a distributed or threshold implementation, you have uh, very good protection against server compromise because you need to compromise a bunch of servers instead of only one. And you also have good protection against denial of service because you need to like the, uh, DOS a bunch of servers instead of only one. And also because in a threshold setting, you can just put away a bunch of shares into an offline uh, secure storage. And so you don't even have a problem with a backup. So a bunch of people like store, to store their keys in HSMs and hardware uh, uh, secure modules. Uh, and if they're good, then you cannot back up them because if you can actually get the keys out, then an attacker can also get them out. And then why do you use an HSM? So um, either you have an HSM that is secure and you cannot back up, and then you have a problem. But with this thing, you always can have like this offline backup, and you'll be safe. If one of your servers or shares get lost, you can just get one out of storage, and uh, you're still safe. So backuping is also something that is much easier with this kind of setup. And then you have updatable encryption. That means that you can actually regularly update your keys, and if anyone has, has access to and leaks your your key shares, they will only be useful as long as you don't update your keys. And so you can get uh, post-compromise security. When your keys get compromised, you just update your keys and they're safe again. Uh, this is also a super, we cannot, well you can do that also with uh, PGP, but with PGP it's much less efficient. With PGP, if you lose your, someone steals your key, what you have to do is you have to decrypt all your data and then re-encrypt it with a new key. So that is on many, first of all, it takes a lot of time, decryption and encryption. It probably also takes a lot of storage because you have to store the files doubly, one in an encrypted form, one in a decrypted form, and then again in it. So it also takes storage. And then the third thing that is really, really sucks is you have to decrypt and your, all your secrets during the key update are in plain text stored on your system. 
And with this system, you do a key update without ever decrypting your data, and still you can update the keys and they will still encrypt it. There's a question, yes. Does the server have to cooperate if they do a key update? Does the server? Have to cooperate if they do a key update. So the I server, the how server. Do I, how do I make sure that the stuff encrypted with the old key is not accessible anymore? Okay, so the question is if the server has to cooperate to update the keys. Yes, the server is holding the keys, so the server has to generate a new key. And I'm going to show later on how that works. Uh, the output of that update is actually verifiable. That is what I'm saying, that when there's a key update, you can verify that the update is correct and all the servers were uh, executing their protocol correctly and none of them was compromised or evil. And you can be sure that this is a, is a good key. And the old key is not used anymore. And uh, after the storage updated, all the data encryption keys, or whatever, it's not quite data encryption keys, but, but something similar, then, then yes, okay. yes. And so you have, uh, and the nice thing is, this whole thing is, uh, is a public key encryption scheme, uh, which means that for encrypting data, you don't need the KMS. You just go to the storage device, and the storage device can store your public key, and you just take the public key and use that to encrypt more data. So for encryption, you don't need to interact with the KMS at all. You only need the KMS for decrypting and for key updates, actually. So this is a bunch of, I think, really, really sexy um, um, things. So the pros is, again, very cheap key rotation, this post-compromise and forward security. You have threshold operation, which didn't exist in in any of our legacy tools that we know until, or that we use or are deployed. Uh, you are much better protected against losing your keys or being denied access to your keys if you outsource this thing. And it's really nice if you like travel to a hostile uh, or cross a border and they want to have access to your keys and you can say, I have no keys, they're all on, uh, I, they're somewhere in some other country and they're all offline now. So you cannot decrypt your hard disk or at all. But at a later t point in time, when your peers verify that you are safe, uh, they actually enable your shares and then you can access your data and decrypt. But you can travel without any keys and they're shared and uh, that's really, really nice. Yes? Or to use um, a bad word, uh, if you use a, a blockchain time lock, you can also simply time lock your data. Yes, you can also use blockchain weeks, so. time locks to... Yeah, I mean, time, you have to do blockchain Yes, but time locks. with time locks you cannot verify if the decryptor yeah. is actually in a safe position because you just have to wait out the time. But here you, have, you can actually have some communication proving that it's safe to enable the shares, for example. And uh, the nice things here is also that the CAC, uh, the K encryption key, is not stored next to your data that is encrypted. When you consider uh, most people have PGP, they have a PGP key on their hard disk, and they have the encrypted data on the same hard disk. So I own your hard disk, and I copy everything, and then I just brute force your password for your PGP key if it's encrypted, and I have it all. Um, and in this case, the key encryption key is, is actually shared, and it's really difficult to get access to, and, uh, and so it's not stored next to the ciphertext. So this is also a really good thing. And then I think it's, I'm not sure if it's a contra, but I, put, I needed to put some contrast here. Huh? So it's online, but online is, I'm not sure if it's really a contra. And the other thing is it needs strong authentication. And so with PGP, your authentication is you know the password, that decrypts your, your private key. So that's the authorization that you have here. But in this system, there's none of that stuff. So in this system, you actually need to have some strong authorization protocols that uh, guard your use of the key in the key MS from anyone else. This is, a, this is maybe a contra. You need to wrap your mind around that. But it also enables a lot of other use cases that with traditional PGP keys you cannot do, or with AGA keys, or with CryptoLux, or whatever legacy tools we have. So this threshold construction and updatable encryption is, is something that really makes me excited about this. Go ahead, your question. Yes. Uh, wait, this is this encryption tool, right? Then I will ask it, we'll ask it, but after that. <clears throat> okay. No question, only a break for drinking beer. So, and this, um, I implemented this, um, this paper, and um, so <clears throat> basically, um, 
Um, the base system is something like, the, what I envision is something like this. You have a three out of five scheme, which means you have five shares of your key, out of which you need at least three shares to actually do anything reasonable with that. So any attacker needs to compromise three of the shares out of the five, um, and I need to have access to three shares to actually decrypt files or update files. And uh, my concept is here that uh, I have some shares on an ESP32 device that is connected via Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. I have uh, an Android phone that does NFC, so the share is accessible by just putting down a phone next to some NFC reader. And then I have a Linux with a 10 gigabyte link, and uh, I have a Raspberry Pi or Wi-Fi. And then I, I am in physical contact of these, and I can decide if I put them, I, I, and they're on power or not. And you can also imagine like having one of these shares held by like the CCC. They, op they, they run a public uh, Kluchnik server. The nice thing about Kluchnik is you don't need to trust the, uh, the KMS. The whole concept of the KMS is that it's, it's, I think it's this bullshit word zero trust, and they never use that word. But here you don't have to trust uh, the KMS or what I call the Kluchnik server at all. It could be in theory, so, uh, also operated by the NSA or whatever, and it still would be safe as long as you always verify that every operation is actually correctly executed. So, so this is the base setup, and uh, this is the base paper also that uh, uh, Stanislav and Hugo and uh, they uh, they wrote down. And so the heart of the uh, of Kluchnik is this uh, threshold OPRF which again, you have some input, then this OPRF, this threshold OPRF function, where you have like all these shares, like uh, these are all uh, KMSs or uh, Kluchnik servers, and they contribute to the OPRF, and the output of this OPRF is then some kind of DAC, data encryption key. And the really nice thing about the setup that I already uh, mentioned earlier, that the CAC, like the reconstruction of all, of all these shares never happens. So the, the, the key that is, I don't know, how many of you know about Shamir's secret sharing? How many don't? How, Shamir's secret sharing. Okay, okay, Shamir's secret sharing is when you have a secret that you want to distribute among, among N people who need T people to reconstruct uh, the secret. Okay, and uh, this is also unconditionally secure as long as you have less than threshold people or, or their shares. Yeah. They cannot reconstruct anything. And, uh, but in Shamir secret sharing, that the whole idea is that you have a secret that you share with your friends or your family or whatever, and like when you die or when something happens, they come together and reconstruct the secret that you shared with them, and then they can decrypt your file system or something. So that is when you reconstruct the secret, and this secret in this system is never reconstructed. This is the really, really cool thing. So there's no way of stealing this secret. Uh, if you have malware sitting there and making memory dumps or something like that. I'm going to show how this works. Yes? Oh, the classic encryption edit and we moved here. The what? The classic encryption edit and we moved here. So yeah, the classic encryption edit and move, removed here, yes. So this is, this, is some, this is really, really cool. Even during key updates, the, the shared secret is never reconstructed. And this is super awesome. And yet you can calculate these operations. And um, the other magical thing that you need to add to this source is something we call distributed key generation. And this is how you generate such a shared secret without ever constructing the secret. So you could, in theory, just do Shamir secret sharing. The client generates a secret, then that just distributes it among all the share, uh, shareholders. But then the secret is known by the client. And the client doesn't need to know, and why would, and we don't need that. So instead, you can make a distributed key generation where the uh, shareholders all interact in a way that in the end, there is a secret generated that is shared among them without any of them ever knowing the secret or the secret ever manifesting itself. Um, this is like Shamir's secret sharing, but there's no trusted third party or the secret, yeah. Can they even 
If all T members get together, they can reconstruct the secret, yes. But uh, the protocol itself doesn't do that. But this is what an attacker would do, right? You need to attack at least T members of this sharing to get enough shares to reconstruct the secret. So this can be an external attacker or an internal attacker. True, yes. So this is a dis distributed key generation is a super sexy concept as well. It's a bit difficult. It assumes quasi that all members of this uh, protocol that do DKG, they are synchronously communicating with each other. And this complicates things a bit. Um, and there is, um, there's a implementation by uh, Aniket Kate and Ian Goldberg uh, who implemented something that doesn't need a synchronous uh, operation and they were able to set up a system with multiple hundred shares over the internet all over the world and doing DKG and all this stuff and it's amazing but when you try to get it to run it's this C++ mess with, with uh, many different directories that I have spent so much time to get it run and I failed so this is like more of an still, I mean, it's practical and they proved it, but for me to set it up, it, it was too expensive to get there. I, I, after some time, I just gave up. Yes? Is that the one they use for Zcash? No, yes. Uh, no, they don't use this for Zcash, but Zcash also uses a DKG, yes. Yeah. And uh, so my solution for solving the synchronicity uh, issue and doing all this is that the client is actually in a star topology communicating with all the shareholders, but in a way that the shareholders are doing end-to-end -end encryption, so the client has no uh, access to what the shareholders are communicating with each other. And this actually also enables this multi-medium communication where one shareholder is doing Wi-Fi, the other one is USB, the third one is doing uh, Bluetooth, the third one is uh, NFC, and I don't know what else. So, uh, and otherwise, they would have all have to support all these mediums and do direct connections. And how do you do a direct connection with something that only does NFC and the other one only does Bluetooth? How do they ever communicate? So it's impossible. So I, I opted for the static uh, topology, and this makes this whole thing much easier and uh, also enables this multi-medium uh, set up. Um, there's one other thing that is m m important to mention that if you want to change the, the T parameter of your scheme, the threshold, then you have to restart the whole thing and regenerate everything and re encrypt everything. You cannot change T. T is fixed. But you can actually change N. So you can generate more shares if you want that. That is possible. But um, you cannot do change T. Um, okay, so we have protected channels. You still need these channels to be protected. But I said that uh, the client is like a star topology and you don't want the client to learn anything of the communications between the shareholders. And for that, I use uh, the noise protocol, which is uh, something that is also, for example, used in WireGuard. Uh, and I use the XK pattern. Uh, and um, so this is, this is very modern and it's, um, it's very simple also and very efficient. So this should, uh, you don't need TLS for doing this really. Um, and I really don't want that. So um, the choice here is noise XK as a pattern. You can look that up, what that means. It basically means that uh, um, K means the, that uh, the key of the server is noun, but the key of the client is uh, not fixed but known. And this leads us to one of the authorization factors that we have, because you can only, con it's like an authorized key file on each of the shareholders that only clients can connect to any of the Klochnik servers or shareholders if they know already the client public key. It's like with SSH uh, authorized key file, right? So that is one layer of authorization. Only, only keys can connect that are already configured. The second uh, thing that uh, allows us to exert some kind of authorization, that you, have phys you can have physical control over the shareholders, like an ESP32 device or a uh, Raspberry Pi or something. You just switch it off and you control kind of like authorize if it's 
actually operational or not. And then there's a third thing that we use, and this is the this top. Uh, I use uh, a bearer token uh, for authorization to uh, use a certain key, and uh, for that I use macaroons. And macaroons are like cookies, just much more powerful and much more sexy. And a few years ago I gave a talk here at Camp Plus Plus about macaroons, and just as a short reminder, macaroon authorization tokens can be delegated, so I can pass on my, my token to someone else. I can attenuate it, so I take, can take away rights from the token, so it means I can like limit what you can do with this authorization token. I can say you can do less, or I limit it in time. I can say you can only use this tomorrow for one hour, this token. Uh, I can do all kinds of uh, limitations there. Uh, they carry their own proof, so they are completely independent. You don't need to query any database. Is this a token, or is this valid, or anything? And uh, some other things that are not so important. Um, but uh, macaroons are super cool things. Uh, you should consider um, if you ever have the idea to use a cookie, maybe you want macaroon. So, and then in Klutschnik, uh, a macaroon is minted when you new, create a new key encryption key with a uh, distributed key generation. And then this macaroon, this is like the master macaroon, is bound to this key ID of this, this new key. And the default is uh, a time to live of one year. So you have to like renew your macaroon in one year. And then you can attenuate it by, by saying this macaroon can only be used by this public key of the client. And so no other client can use this. If you don't have that public key, you can have like a shorter expiration date or uh, just uh, it, it starts to be alive, this macaroon, sometimes next week, and then it expires the week after. And you can also limit actions, like with this macaroon, you can only update uh, key encryption keys, or with this macaroon, you can only decrypt. And so you can also separate these functions, and then you can actually have like a cron job that every day updates uh, your key encryption key with a macaroon that only enables you to update keys, but doesn't allow you to decrypt files which is, I think, a super cool thing. So we can have like this automatic service that does key updates without actually being able to decrypt. Yes? If I understood your answer to the earlier question correctly, they still have to kind of re-encrypt the old data to completely... No, they don't have to re-encrypt the old data. So they only re-encrypt the data <laughs> encryption key. Uh -huh. And it's not really re-encryption either. It's yeah, much it's more exactly, efficient. Yeah, exactly. It's also not... It's not very... It's much more efficient, yes. Um, so you don't, uh, and I'm going to come to that in a few slides. So uh, for file encryption, because sometimes you encrypt files that are much bigger and you want to have authenticated uh, encryption, and with uh, stream ciphers, you cannot do that in memory. So there's all kinds of stupid things that you can do, like make segments of 46 kilobyte, and then you encrypt those, and then you have a Mac, and then you have an X segment, 46 kilobyte in the Mac. Uh, but those can be just rearranged. Or you can drop the end and you can just truncate files. So there's all kinds of things that, you can, that can go wrong because all your data needs to fit in RAM when you do the encryption and the authentication. And so it is very difficult to also, you'd want to avoid to actually decrypt a file that doesn't, where the Mac, the message authentication uh, is not correct. So PGP was doing that, I think. That uh, it was decrypting and then noticing, oh shit, the uh, Mac is incorrect, but uh, it's already decrypted, oh, okay, fuck it. And so there's a, a lot of things that can go wrong, and for that I'm using, I'm, I'm using this paper, this online authenticated encryption and non-misuse resistance, resistance paper that actually is a very strong, uh, has a strong security model and takes care of all these. And so this is like uh, something that is a modern construct for doing stream inscription while it is also being authenticated. And uh, so and this is also, I think, quite the same that, for example, Aga uses on for doing the, the final encryption of data. So this is something that I share with Aga. So, and here comes the slide on key updates, and this is something that, if you saw my previous talk, it was quite the same, but there's some small differences here. You might fall asleep, but uh, this is the exciting, and this is the only part where I see, where I show you some math and some Greek letters. Um, so, um, 
for each client, the KMS has a secret key KC. C is for clients, so each. Um, and the storage has a public key, which is just this generator exponentiated by KC. So this is like a traditional elliptic curve uh, private public key pair, if we think in elliptic curves. There's nothing magic here. This is completely traditional stuff. And so uh, when you do an encryption, you don't even need to consult the KMS. You just choose a random value R and just take the generator exponentiated by this random value, and you get this omega value. And your D data encryption key is nothing else than your public key, which is a public key, right? And that exponentiated to this R value that is just random in this case. And then the output of that is hashed. And this is an OPRF. But you see here, this one operation is a so-called hash DH OPRF or PRF. It might be just a PRF. In this case, it's just a PRF because it's done by the same party. All the inputs come from the same party. But this is something later on that will be done as an OPRF. But here, it's one, it's the, it's the storage that is doing that. There's no involvement of a client or of, uh, of a KMS. And then all you do is you store the object ID, this omega value, and the ciphertext, which is just the encryption with the data encryption key of your object. That's all. This is happening on the storage. All you need is a, is a public key and a random value that you just generate randomly. So this is, this is encryption. And decryption is, of course, you need to retrieve this value that was encrypted, which is the object ID, omega, and the ciphertext. And here comes the OPRF, where you do this OPRF with the KMS. The KMS has this value key C, as we established in the first line. And uh, you have this omega value, and these two, if you remember, you have two inputs, but only one learns the output, and no one learns the input of the other, right? That is what an OPRF is. So in this case, you have the KMS, KMS has the input KC, the client has omega, they calculate a common value, and this common value is actually exactly the same data encryption key here that was actually the data encryption key here. And with this data encryption key, you can just decrypt the ciphertext and you have a plain text. That's it. It's very simple. I think um, it's pretty straightforward and I hope it's more or less understandable. Yes? Uh, it's a syndicate question to Levi, my understanding. The store server does know Omega, but the key management server does not. Is that correct? The storage knows Omega, the KMS does not know Omega and never learns it. That's a very important thing. That's why you use an OPRF. It should never learn the omega value. And so, and then the last operation, so this is like decryption, and rotation and update of keys is this, uh, this two-step thing where the KMS generates a completely new key and calculates this data value, which is just the new key divided by the old key. That's it, that's data. Both of these values, k uh, prime c and kc, are 32 byte uh, values that are elliptic curve points. And you can, you can actually divide those two and have another 32 byte value. That 32 byte value is delta. And then you also update your new public key. Your new public key is just the generator mod, uh, exponentiated to k prime uh, c. And this you send to the storage. You send basically just this data value to the storage, which is the division of the old key by the new key, or the, the other way around, and the new public key. So you send that to the storage. And everything, all the storage does is, and the, actually, KMS can here delete the old key already. Um, and the storage just replaces the old public key with the new public key, and with each of these, uh, encrypted files, which has an object ID, an omega, and a ciphertext, all it does, it exponentiates this omega value by delta. And what happens here is, omega, if you remember, is um, um, this value, and uh, here, due to this delta, it gets this 
this value. And when you do the OPRF, uh, you get this value, and, and then this KC falls out, and only KC prime stays. And so with this data, you can eliminate the old uh, key in your DAC and replace it with a new value. Yes. And I think about it like as an analogy to like rolling cipher, where it like counts up one and then. It is kind of like counting up one, like a rolling cipher. But really, the the keys are independent from each other. But the data encryption keys they have a relationship to each yeah, other. So it's like the relationship is the division, like yeah. With Rolling cipher, the relationship is like counting plus. But you eliminate the old key only. So it's like dividing by the old key. Omega is just really that. And then you eliminate that. That's, that's what it is. Yes? Uh, what if I want to implement a scheme where I have, let's say, two different machines that access a drive? And so in the traditional way with the Linux key slot, I would give each one key file, the key file goes with the key slot and each machine has a different key file and unlocks the drive with a different key. Uh, so any of these machines that have access can open it, so like a one of n scheme. Uh, how would it do that in this? Can we come back to this after, with a beer afterwards? Yes. <laughs> cool. Okay, so the next step is how do you do this with an OPRF uh, in a threshold setting? So um, how how do you trans how do, how do you do this whole uh, Kluchnik thing with a threshold thing? And so in this case, you have this key that is K, and it's shared like a Shamir secret sharing. But we know that it's used it's generated by a distributed key generation, and it's shared among n shareholders with a threshold T. So it is just very simple, and that's what I was told for like three years. All you have to do is just do Lagrange interpolation in the exponent. And I was like wondering for like three years, what the fuck does that mean? And I had no clue. And it took me really a long time to understand and get a grip on that. And that's why I only implemented this now and not earlier. Uh, basically, Lagrange interpolation is, is all you have to do is calculate this lambda e value. And this lambda e value there's nothing secret in there. It's basically just the, uh, every shareholder has an index. Like when you generate the uh, shares, you have someone who has share e, uh, zero, share one, share two, share three. And that, those are the indexes of the shares. They never change. And when you do your operation, then some of these shareholders contribute. And the Lagrange uh, coefficient is just the indexes of the shares that contribute to this operation. So you know who uh, I got answer from shareholder one, two, and three, and that's enough for me. So now the indexes, and I can calculate the, this lambda Lagrange coefficient. And all I do is I have to also do a scalar multiplication with that. Uh, and that's it. It's a very simple thing. And uh, it looks complicated here. This is the how you calculate lambda e. But it's really just a, a division and some multiplication in a loop. It's nothing else. It's really, and it's very simple. Um, it's like small numbers, even. It's like the, the indexes of the shareholders. And usually you have like shareholders of five or so. So these are numbers of one to five or so. So these are very small numbers and very easily calculatable. Especially, the only, um, um, the only clue in this whole situation is that you actually do this not with, uh, well, you start with small numbers, but you do this in elliptic curve uh, fields. And then when you calculate these values, you get actually pretty random looking, pretty big numbers, but they're pretty constant. They're not really random, they're very predictable. But when you look at them, you are like, okay, what is this? And then you figure out this is like something like minus 25, but minus 25 looks like a random 32 byte value. And so there's two variants where you can do this. Either you know in advance the servers that you are communicating with, and you know their indexes, because you know they're always online. So you can, when you do your operation, you can tell each shareholder, these are the indexes of all the others, and then the shareholders can do the Lagrange interpolation locally. 
and you don't have to do anything, and everything else is just like in your normal OPRF. The first step where you blind is exactly the same, and if you know the indexes of who you're uh, working with, the, they do the Lagrange interpolation in the exponent, and everything happens there. And in the end, the last step is just a multiplication of all the results. But if you, but that is a, an, I think it's an optimistic uh, thing to expect. You know who's going to answer. Most of the time, you have like five servers, and you know, need only three answers. And maybe something is down, and you don't know which is down. But as soon as you have three answers, you can actually work. And then you have this random set of indexes that answer to you. And so this is the second operation that you can do, where the first two steps in the OPRF are the same, like the blinding and what the server is doing. But then you do the Lagrange interpolation in the last step. And these are the two variants that I described here. Basically, the only difference between those two steps is that you multiply here with uh, lambda e in the second step, and you multiply with lambda e here in the third step. And that's the only difference. And that, that multiplication with lambda e is what we call, if we're really uh, trying to be elitist uh, mathematic assholes, this is what we call, you just simply do Lagrange interpolation in the exponent. And then you like, if you have no clue, you wait three years until you, you get a grip on what that actually means. So this is it. I spare you three years of thinking about this. And if you don't get it, I'm happy to uh, make it and uh, explain it to you. It's really, really simple afterwards. Um, so this is a threshold updatable KMS. Oh yeah, the, the next step is, how do you threshold system where you can update uh, the key? When you have the sh key is shared among many people. Uh, you have generated with a distributed key generation. Well, in this case, all you do is you generate a new value, P, and then all you do is, and this sounds simple again, it's not quite, you do a multi-party multiplication of the old key and this new value, P, and that generates a new key, and P is actually data already, so you don't need to calculate data anymore, and you just send uh, each of the but because P is never constructed on the clients, uh, they all have just a share of P. Uh, they do, so basically what is happening here, everyone has a share of K and everyone has a share of P, but none of both of these values, neither P or K, exist ever reconstructed. And yet with this multi-party multiplication, you can actually multiply all the shares together and calculate what the multiplication of these two values would be if you would just know both of these values and just multiply them. But you do that in a multi-party uh, multi computation way without ever reconstructing the values and you get just this result. The new shares that are shared by all these people are actually the result of doing the multiplication of K by P. Yes? What if I'm one of the shareholders of the original key and I don't? If one of the shareholders is missing, then he's not being able to participate in this protocol anymore. You need all the shareholders uh, to participate. As stated in note two, right? Yes. <laughs> actually, yes. If I'm a hacked shareholder or so, I can actually block an update from happening. Yeah. Well, you can lose a, out of n, you can reduce n there, yeah. but you can also calculate more n's. It, do, it okay. reduces some security guarantees. You shouldn't do that, but it's yeah. possible to increase n, as I said earlier. So this is also how you add shareholders? Sorry, what? This is also how you add shareholders. At this point, you could add shareholders, actually, when you key update, in a way that is actually secure. T is unchangeable, and if you want to run this uh, threshold update, update uh, protocol, there's this hard uh, condition that you need to have at least uh, two T plus one participants to this update. And so this is a, this is a pretty, pretty big limitation because if you want to have an updatable scheme, then you need to have at least this many shareholders. 2t plus 1. This is something that needs to be considered. Note 1. Okay. Um, just to rehash, encryption, the storage only needs the pub key of the key it encrypts to. So we saw that earlier. 
decryption, then the client needs a noise key pair to actually connect to the servers to be have an encrypted channel. And it needs an authorization macaron to be able to communicate. And this is the same for key updates also. So you need always, as a client, you need uh, a public-private key pair and you need an authorization macaron for that. But you can store this in a, in a config file, but that sucks. Then you have to encrypt the config file. And then what do you use for encrypting the config file? Do you use Klochnik? But how do you get to decrypt that? Because you need to get access to decrypt that. So it's a chicken and egg problem. And so you don't do that. Uh, you can, but that sucks, really. So instead, what I do, we have a T-OPRF. We have a threshold OPRF already at our disposal. And Hugo and Stanislav and some other people, they actually came up with a protocol a few years before, which is called OPAC. And uh, the first threshold version of OPAC is implemented by me. Um, and you can actually store completely arbitrary blobs in OPAC. This is exactly what... Uh, WhatsApp is doing for their backups, except for they're not using threshold set setup of OPAC, they're using uh, HSM in the background for backing up all your chat data in WhatsApp. And, but we have already all these Kluchnik servers who can do uh, distributed key generation and can do threshold OPRF. So with those, we already have everything in place to do OPAC in a threshold setting. And with OPAC, we can uh, encrypt data uh, and the keys for the encryption are stored in, in this whole thing. And in OPAC, we can store your public-private key pair and we can store your macaroon. And that means you can use this whole system, if you combine it with this uh, threshold OPAC setup, you can use this whole system with only one password to get access to your keys and to get access to your authorization tokens that are stored in OPAC. And then with those tokens and keys, you can access uh, Kluchnik and you can decrypt all your files. And all is only possible with one password. You can migrate to other devices, you can do this on other computers. All you need to do is some public config file where you have like noted where the servers are, what the IP addresses and ports are. It's all public info. It could be hosted by the CCC, some or some in France or something, you know, friends. And uh, that's all public data. And all you need to secure your your keys and your authorization data is actually protected by uh, uh, a password in OPAC. And uh, there is this tool that is completely independent from, well, it needs uh, the Kluchnik servers for, for the threshold operations, but uh, uh, it's called OPAC Store, it's a threshold OPAC uh, system, and it's a very nice extension to Sphinx. With Sphinx, you can only store limited size passwords, and if you want to store like more arbitrary like uh, certificates or like your questions, your security account re recovery question answers or stuff like that, you can actually store this in, in uh, an OPAC store, which is a really nice thing. And in the background, it's a threshold setup, which uh, has the same uh, benefits as uh, the threshold setup in <coughs> Kluchnik. Okay, so... You can have really nice encrypted archives with this setup. Uh, you can have one of the use cases for us is I'm doing, we're doing pen testing. And when we're done with the project, uh, we have all the artifacts during our pen test, the report and all the log files and the scans and shit like that. And we encrypt that and put it in offline storage so that when we are act, then, you know, this surprise offline backup thing by the technical debt collectors, um, we are losing less data than if everything would be online. So like for us, this is a really nice thing to keep our data offline, secure, and in a threshold setup where project managers and CEO have to agree together to recover and decrypt a previous project, for example. So this is some kind of archives that you can do with this, or backup or encrypted backups, also online. You can just upload the, these backups then to Dropbox or whatever. They will have no access to it. You can pass border controls, as I said. You can also just share with the macaroons. You can limit the time someone is able to decrypt files. You can just share for, you have access to this for a week and then it's gone. And then you can also just, uh, and I think it, it has a different security model. So it depends on how you do it. 
but uh, in some cases it might be better than just an HSM, especially if you depend on like uh, availability and you don't have backups and you cannot do backups, or if you need like for us uh, a committee to decrypt, or I am um, actually planning to do a fusive front end, so you have like this encrypted file system based on this, where the directories each are their own like uh, meta files. And one of the things I'm going to do very soon is a Raspberry Pi image, so you can just set up dedicated Raspberry Pis that you can use via Wi-Fi as these Kluchnik servers, and then you just have your setup, and you can cheaply set up the system. You have physical access over it. You can place it at your mom, at your family, at your friends, or whatever. And you can tell them, Grandma, press the red button on the, the Raspberry Pi. And then it goes on or off. Um, so, and uh, I want to port this whole system to Zephyr OS. So it runs on all the embedded devices. Uh, we are um, like you know arms and so on uh, and one more thing the the current implementation is actually there's a one big big problem the macaroons are checked with a global key that is shared by all the uh, shareholders and that really sucks because with the global key you can just fake any macaroon and anyone has any access, so this is just a tech demo. And in a final version, I actually, I'm gonna do a threshold signature over the macaroon. So everyone has to agree to sign a macaroon, and then they cannot fake that, because they all have to co uh, cooperate. So we are also gonna diffuse the authorization over multiple um, um, and And then somewhere in the future, I also want to do extends Sphinx, the password manager, to support a threshold setup, which is going to be super amazing. And then last but not least, I want to also possibly have like this generic API, so you can build your own threshold system based on that. And so you have threshold OPRF, threshold distributed key generation, and you just build your own client that does all kinds of stuff with your own keys without having like access to keys that do Kluchnik stuff or something. So this is, um, this is the future. And if you want to have a look, there's some Docker images. This is very small, but you can see the slides later on on the website. So there's Docker images where you can just uh, set them up and run them and play with this. Or you can look at my code, which is awesome. <laughs> uh, it's beautiful. And uh, I guess that's it. But I had a lot of questions and comments already. If you have some more, shoot them, and then we can have drinks and food and, and everything. Um, the thing that um, it's the it's really the threshold OPRF that is that is happening here. This one, this super beautiful picture of mine, is um, the output is the is the DAK, the data encryption key, really. And the OPRF never calculates the the key encryption key, really. The key encryption key is in those shares. And um, uh, maybe I can um, I can show you a slide from my previous presentation. No idea where it is. Okay, so, but basically what happens here is uh, this is the, this is the, the, the one, the, the non-threshold version of the OPRF, right? So in the first step, Alice has a message M and there's a random blinding factor R. 
and then Alice hashes her message, and then which becomes a point on an elliptic curve, magically. We've been waiting for this magic since 2002. What? Yes. Uh, and then just takes this elliptic curve point and raises it to this blinding factor R. And then it goes over to Bob, and Bob has its key, and it just multiplies this whole thing by K, his key, and then sends the whole thing back. And then you have like this value where you HM has been multiplied by R and K, and then you multiply it by 1 divided by R, so R is falling out. And then that is the result, okay? Okay. So, and um, I don't have this here actually. That's a, I should actually add this to this slide set, but uh, I think I have something here. Uh, but so, is the, the concept behind it with the removing the known? Well, the TOPRF is really essentially this slide. Um, actually, this slide. Um, so what happens here in the first step is exactly the same as I was on my beautiful graphics, where you have this R random value, which is the blinding factor. And then you just hash your message and then multiply it or exponentiate it to the blinding factor. So this blinding factor is exactly the same thing as on um, where is that? Did I have it here? Yeah. So this is exactly the same step here, yeah, right? This is exactly the same, except I have call it hash prime here, but that doesn't matter, and x instead of m. So this is the first step. This is exactly the same in the one and in the threshold setup. And then in the Depending on if you know the indexes of the re re uh, replies, you can do either the first step or the second step. Uh, so let's assume you don't know the indexes. Okay? So you go here. Every shareholder gets this alpha value that you calculate, the blinded thing. Every shareholder gets that. And all they do is they just do exactly the same step as they did here. This is exactly the same. The second step is completely the same. And then, in the third step, and this is the magic where it happens, they all send this beta E back, and this is this beta E. And then each of those beta E's is being exponentiated by their respective lambda E's. And lambda E, you just calculate like this. That's, it's, uh, it's just the indexes, so like, ES is the set of indexes that replied. And uh, the J index is just the index of uh, like 0, 1, or 2. And you make sure that E is never equal to J. So the, say, the own index is not contributing to this calculation. And that's it. It's really just uh, index 0, so then 0, divided by E, that is the index of the current, uh, and minus the index of whatever, zero in this case. And then you multiply this value with the next value, and so on and so on. This is really just the multiplication of these, of these indexes. That's, that's really, there's nothing secret about this, nothing magic. The only magic is you do this with elliptic curves um, um, scholars. That's the only magic here. And so, and that's, that's this lambda here, and then this lambda gets multiplied and then you just multiply all these beta to lambda e values together and this multiplication of all these together is the result of the OPRF. That's it. This is, this is the magic, how you do threshold OPRF. This is the uh, Lagrange interpolation in the exponent. That is what's happening. And you can do this operation also here, if you know it in advance. But then you need to send to the client the set of the indexes of the parties that will respond. And that is what you see here. So in this case, the second step is where you do this lambda e multiplication. And uh, this is then different than here. This is the change. But then, this last step is almost the same. Because in this last step, all you do is 
you actually have to multiply all the answers together. That's because you have multiple answers. You have to do something. You just multiply all of them. That's it. And then you remove the blinding factor over all of them at the same time. So the difference between those two approaches is who is doing more work. In the first case, the servers do an extra multiplication, each of them. And here you just multiply all the uh, responses together. You always have to do that. That's unavoidable. Or if you, if you actually don't know the values, then the servers don't do any extra uh, work. But you have to do one extra multiplication before you multiply all these. Actually, uh, t more multiplications than than. Either the the shareholder or the client calculates lambda. Yes, exactly. If you know it in advance, then the shareholder. If you don't, then the client. And that's how you how you combine the shares into into the output of the OPRF. The important part here is that you can only do this with OPRFs who calculate a result that has the form of M to K. That's what is happening basically here. If you have M exponentiated by K, then you can do this kind of magic. Now it makes more sense. You're welcome. Yes? The key encryption key on the KMS, that one always stays the same, right? No, okay. that's what you update. Hmm? That's the thing that you update. Ah, okay. That makes more sense. That's the one that you update when, when you update it. And that's the one that is also exploded into shares. Hmm. But the encryption key itself stays constant. The what? The encryption key itself. Which encryption key? Data or key? You have something like a key that you're yeah. encrypting. It's not quiet, but yeah. yeah. There's no encrypted, there's no data encryption key that is being encrypted. The data encryption key is like derived. There's food being prepared and being shown, or yeah. it's ready. Let's oh, go it's, and. It's 10 o'clock, so it should be ready. Uh, let's go and eat if there's no questions. And if there is, I'm happy on the way back.